Looking forward to this. I've already done a couple of, of either the panel and, and the uh, talk earlier, so I won't go spend too much time on myself. I really want to focus on what we're do doing here. Um, I will say, though, that there will be a trivia question at the end of this. I have a book that is Data Wrangling on AWS. So if you still read paper books or you have something heavy that you don't want to blow away, uh, this, will, uh, this works for either of those. So um, there will be a question at the end so that, to, to win that book. Um, so before I get into sort of talking about the actual Airflow code, I'm going to do a little history lesson. So back on July 16th, 1969, a Saturn V rocket took off from Cape Canaveral, Florida, Kennedy Space Center. Um, it had about 4.5 million pounds of fuel, which is about seven, uh, sorry, 763 elephants worth. And sitting on top of all, those, all that fuel were three astronauts, Michael Collins, Buzz Aldrin, and Neil Armstrong. That was the Apollo 11 crew. And they were about to go off to fly the uh, 384,000 kilometers between here and the moon. To get them to that moon and to get them that 384,000 kilometers and get into an orbit only 100 kilometers off the moon's surface, get two of them down to the surface, get them back up, get them all home, they had the Apollo guidance computer. The AGC was developed in, at MIT. Had about, it had thousands of in, individual transistors and things like that in it and had a whopping 74 kilobytes of memory to do all that work. So. What can we do today with that? Surely we can do better, right? Well, I did a little test on the M1 MacBook over there, and here's the code I can do in 74 kilobytes. <laughs> Not exactly a moon launch, is it? Now, in all fairness, it's bootstrapping Python, and it's doing a bunch of other stuff, too. It's, you know, that's a little bit, a little bit disingenuous, but the point's there, right? We, you know, we're just doing a lot less with a lot more. And there are still some lessons you can get from this, though, when you dig into it. So if we look at exactly what's happening in those two lines of code, and we look at the CPU resources when your profile is thing, 98% of those resources are used just importing that date time library. Only about 2% are used doing actual work that we care about. And that actually lines up with what the, the Airflow documentation says. Oops, let me go back. Back. There we go. In the Airflow documentation, it says very specifically, you know, don't do imports if you don't need to, right? Don't do top level code. Don't import NumPy on the top level if you don't want to, uh, you know, if you want to save resources, work more efficiently, run better, put it inside the task, right? I just screenshot this right out of the, uh, the Airflow documentation. So the question then is though, so what? I don't care, I got lots of compute. What do I care? There's lots, you know, there's lots of, you know, who cares if it takes a little extra time? Who cares if it uses a little bit of extra resources? But the reality is that even though you're not necessarily trying to get someone to the moon, you're still, you know, consuming a lot of resources that you don't need to. And there is actually a time and money impact to using those extra resources. So my goal today is to show you a couple of examples. I can't be exhaustive. Airflow is in Python. You can do whatever the heck you want with it. But I'm going to give a couple of examples that are going to drastically improve so, you know, your airflow code. And you can use a few of them and see what exactly, you know, and, and see how they help. So I'm going to start with an example. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and I have a use case where I have some downstream, some upstream source. So it could be database tables, could be objects in some bucket somewhere. It doesn't matter what it is. And I need to generate DAGs that will move those things somewhere else. I don't necessarily know the number up front. I want to be able to get things from A to B. So there's a couple ways I could do this. One is I could just write a script that goes ahead and says, OK, for each one of these little objects, create a DAG, uh, a Python file that describes the DAG, throw that in my DAG folder, away you go. Should be pretty straightforward. And in fact, we have in the best practices documentation in the Airflow docs, it suggests do that. It actually says fewer DAGs per file. Well, there you go. Left-hand side is definitely fewer DAGs per file. But right below that in the Airflow documentation, it also says, but you should write efficient code. And so it's far more efficient for me to just write one file, one Python file that goes through and just loads all the DAG, like creates all these DAG objects, right? Because as it says at the top, DAGs do not equal Python files. A DAG is an object, a file is just a file. 
You might have many DAGs in one file. You might have many files that create one DAG. It doesn't really matter. So what's, what's the right way to do that then? Well, to take a look at it, I'm just, I was just making sure the last presenter, they put code up and the screen freaked out, so I just want to make sure that didn't happen. Um, so I've got two examples. The one is exactly sort of it's the DAG that was created by like a CICD pipeline, spits out a bunch of individual files. Each one has the you know, database table or whatever it is. The second example loops through a list of them. Maybe it pulled them out of a local JSON or something like that or whatever it is. So what's the difference between those two? Well, when we look at the scheduler CPU performance between those two, you can see how the first example is using steadily 50 to 60% of a two virtual CPU scheduler. The second example is barely cracking 10 and only then only when it schedules it. Exact same, you saw the code, it's exactly the same thing. So why is that? Well, it actually goes back to our example with date time. So when you're processing a DAG file, the, schedule, the, the uh, DAG file processor has to import all these Python libraries, including all the Airflow libraries, because it's got nothing. It's got to import all these things the very first time it does anything, which is super inefficient. And so that's why the scheduler is spending all this time, import, you know, spins up a DAG file processor for all 500 files. It goes through and spits out you know, each one each time. So what does that have to do with cost? Well, I can take that as second example and I can maybe take away one of those virtual CPUs altogether. I don't need two, it doesn't, like, clearly it doesn't need two. It's got lots. And depending on where you're running that, a virtual CPU can be a few hundred dollars a year to a few thousand, right? And add that over a bunch of use cases, right? Then it actually starts to add up and actually you know, will impact your, your, uh, your bottom line. Another thing that can help is staggering the start time. So let's take that exact same use case and let's say I need to process this every hour, right? So every hour I need to make sure that my data lake is updated with whatever the source data was from this or whatever it is. So it's perfectly reasonable to, when you get that, you, that requirement that says I need to do it every hour to put in the cron to the string hourly. Makes per it's literally what you just wanted to do. So, but I don't really need to do that. What I actually do need to do is just make sure that within an hour period, each of these sources gets processed. So again, looking at those two, it doesn't seem like a big deal. So in the second example, I'm just taking, well, I'm gonna take the total number of files I have, the length of this thing, which is like 500, divide out over 60 minutes, create you know, a certain batch, which if my math is correct is about 12 a minute, and I'll get them all done within an hour. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is, if the scheduler still has something to schedule, it will not take a break. It is obsessed. It is gonna go through and say, if I, hey, I still got DAGs to schedule here. It will not take a breather. It's just gonna do that nonstop. And eventually, it's gonna just run out of steam. And when you look at the results of the, all, you know, all at once, all the hourly versus the staggered, we can see that our task time, the duration, is about six times longer on average. Because all these tasks are flowing in all at once. By the time everything gets picked up and, and whatever you have is the back end. Now I'm using Celery. It's actually, you know, potentially a little bit, you know, in some cases it might even be worse when you're using um, uh, uh, Kubernetes, but it still applies, right? And the other aspect is, look at the scheduler heartbeat. So the second one's kind of, it's certainly hard to see, but it's the blue line. It's nice and steady, never really dipped. Whereas where I had all of them start all at once, every time I do that, the scheduler gets really hard hit. And what does that mean? It means the minimum CPU you have for that scheduler has to be a certain level, because every one of those dips, you don't want it to just blow up. So you've got to make sure you're hitting that, that minimum. So again, I can now reduce the schedule resources and I can reduce my worker resources. Six times less uh, uh, task execution time, one sixth the cost. Of course, deferrable operators, there's been a bunch of sessions on these already. This is kind of a no brainer. If you're not writing the task in an operator, obviously you're not paying for that task in the operator. That's sort of a, you know, sort of goes without saying. So definitely this is an easy way to just, if you're able to use deferrable operators and not everyone is, but if you are able to use them, no task in the worker, fewer workers, less cost. The next one actually go is, is dynamic task masking. And this was one that I didn't even know for sure would help. And this was a bit of a surprise to me that it did. So I'm gonna take a use case and this one's you know pretty heavy, so I've got a thousand things to do. Actually, 2,000 technically. I've got, I need to run one task on the first th thousand and I need to pass those to another thousand. And this could be, the list could be anything. Again, it could be a list of tables, it could be a list of files. I don't know what it is, right? Almost doesn't matter. But 
the question is, you know, which of these is better, right? In one case, I'm defining all of my, my uh, tasks up front, just loop through them, create one after another, very straightforward way to do it, makes perfect sense. But in the second case, I'm just using, you know, there's, there's clearly less code, there's not a loop in there. So that's probably better, but I don't know what's going on in that expand thing. I don't, maybe that's, that might be doing all sorts of crazy stuff, who knows what that's doing. Well, and again, your mileage may vary, but when I tested this out, exactly that use case, you can see in the first case, the DAG file processing, this might sort of go without saying, because it kind of makes sense when you look at the code, it's anywhere from four to 40 times better parsing DAGs, 40 times better do get with the exact same result, and that's a lot of tasks. That's like 2,000 tasks, too. Um, the schedule of CPU, not surprisingly, you know, is a tiny fraction of the CPU hit trying to process all those, because it's not doing all that parsing all the time. It's not trying to go through, every time it has to do a parse cycle, it's looping through a 1,000 things and having to create the, the, the task instances for each one of those. It's not doing that, right? The worker CPU, so the worker CPU, when those things schedule, the peak CPU on the workers is far less, almost half. Goes, it basically doesn't max out at all, it hits about 50 or 60%, whereas it maxed out on, on all those, you know, and not surprisingly, again, that's 2,000 tasks a lot. It's, it, you're, I'm, I'm deliberately mean, you know, kind of being mean to it, but. And it pegged that worker CPU for three times longer than the other CPU even ran. So it's far less, far fewer resources in that case. We're talking about, you know, at minimum a third uh, less resources. And again, not surprisingly, the length of time the tasks were running is one third of the length of time because it was, it was, you know, it was running faster. It ran faster with fewer resources. It's a third less time running. So your total hours that you're going to be spending your money on is far less. And I would say, I'm guessing most folks in here probably use a cloud service for their for their airflow, for the most part, unless you're, you know, except for maybe dev testing. So somewhere, somehow, those, those hours are gonna add up. Oh, hang on, back. And then last but certainly not least is Secrets Backends. Um, you know, there was actually, uh, Mark actually mentioned this in his talk as well, is using the Secrets Cache. This is an experimental feature. I think if we all use it, it will stop being experimental and it'll just start being mental, um, but definitely use this, because the th way the secrets backend works, and I think most folks probably realize this, is if you enable a secrets backend, every single request for a variable or a connection are all going through that, whether it exists there or not. It's always going to be doing that, right? And that's a lot of API calls, regardless of what you're using, you know? And not only does that, a lot of API calls just from a pure how much the scheduler is having to work to process all these things. It's a lot of API calls and costs, right? AWS charges you a penny for, or sorry, five pennies for every one of those 10,000 calls. GCP is three th cents, Azure's three cents. Um, that adds up, because remember that airflow parsing loop is infinite. It's just gonna be running all time, all, you know, every day whether you need it to or not. And so every time it's pulling one of those things, it doesn't need it. If you set that t time to live to 15 minutes, Right? It's only going to pull that once every 15 minutes. If you're running those hourly tasks, are, 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 is your connection really going to change every hour? Probably not. Set it to an hour. Right? Save on all those tasks. And eventually, those secrets manager um, uh, or key vault calls will eventually drop to negligible. And, and your operations folks that pay the bills will go bother someone else and they won't be bothering you anymore. Some of the secrets uh, uh, backends also support a lookup pattern, which is basically a regex that lets you say, not only do I only want you to measure, check these a certain number of times, don't even bother for things that don't meet this prefix or suffix, or for some of you regex gurus out there, you can probably come up with super cool ways to, to rule those out, right? But just don't even bother asking if you don't need it, which is a, is a, is a big benefit as well. So I do want to highlight some resources that will help you. And again, this was a very brief, you know, sort of here's a couple of things maybe you thought of, maybe you hadn't, to be able to help you reduce those costs, which I know is something that is still very much front of mind for most organizations. Um, and you know, no one's ever gotten in trouble going to their boss and saying, hey, I got a way to save us money. So the best practices, most of the stuff I brought up in here is in there. 
Obviously, they're probably not with some of the stats that I put in there, but it's definitely in there. This is something that anyone who writes Airflow code should know back to front and sideways. As I said, there are some contradictory things in those, unfortunately, so you've got to sort of decide you know, which one applies to you or not. Um, but it is super important. Dig into the deferrable operators and the dynamic task mapping. You know, these are things, you know, most of the provider packages now have deferrable operator support. It's definitely something to dig into. It's really, um, again, it's, it's, as I sort of said during that point, it's pretty much a no brainer, right? It just offloads the tasks that you, instead of having it occupy a slot while it's polling and waiting for something else to happen, it dumps it over to a trigger service, which does the polling on a bunch of them all at once and frees up that, that worker. And the dynamic task mapping, uh, I actually just found out in the last session too, one of the limitations right now with the dynamic ta task mapping is you, you just get like a number, like there's sort of like task one, task two, task three, but there's a PR open right now to have that where you can provide a name for each of those things. So get in there and thumbs up that PR. I forgot to write the number down, but it, it was in the last session. Um, because that's that will make it even more powerful. Because right now it's a little bit hard to figure out. Like, was that is that map task twenty three or twenty four? But once you can actually put a na name beside that, it's going to be fantastic. Um, secrets caching, you know, get out there, use it. That way, if, if if someone takes a look at it and threatens to take it away, we can all grab our pitchforks and make sure that they don't do that. You know, you uh, you know, in my cold dead hands, you'll take my secrets cache. Uh, it is, you know, it, as uh, I mentioned this on my talk yesterday, it was a bit of a controversial thing, like, you know, sort of the idea that maybe we shouldn't be telling, you know, offering caching, maybe this is just something people should do as part of their DAG code. It's hugely powerful, it makes your life really easy, and it's just, you know, it, it's so much easier to, to just reduce your costs and improve your performance there. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, shameless self-promotion. I did do an Airflow at Scale talk last year. It covered some of these talk topics in a little bit more depth. Uh, I also did one specific to MWA, but it's actually the, you know, very similar. It's got some other similar things to this, but it is applicable to all of Airflow. Um, you know, encourage you to take a look at some of those. They do have a lot of these techniques in there. The PR number is oh. 32520. 32520 is your PR number. 3252, bingo, we have it right here in the front. Uh, yes, please go in there, give it some thumbs up. Let's get that PR uh, going because that makes dynamic task mapping uh, even cooler than it already is. Yeah, I was wondering how do these performance numbers differ based on the infrastructure that is chosen for uh, Airflow DAG execution, like Kubernetes versus VM versus whatever other um, infrastructure differences? may exist? It, it, it's going to vary greatly. Your mileage will absolutely vary. Um, you know, I tried to make it as, as sort of generic as possible, just run it in a container and see how it behaves. Um, obviously, there's a lot of nuances if you're running in a big Kubernetes uh, pool of resources and they kind of share them in weird ways and all sorts of stuff like that. I, I think, in general, the guidance applies regardless how you're running it. I think the improvements are variable depending on, like if you have, I imagine no one's really doing this, but let's say you're running this on like a VM farm in, in your, your server and you know, the server's a sunk cost anyways. It's not gonna, it doesn't matter whether it's doing a lot or doing a little, it's just gonna be already there. So obviously there's no cost improvements there other than maybe being able to increase your density of things you're doing. But for anyone that is running it on a, you know, hourly type payment service, it's definitely gonna benefit you regardless of how you actually uh, uh, implement Airflow. All right, thank you. You're welcome. And it's also just not a bad practice. Like, no one's ever going to yell at you for writing good code. Well, someone might, but you can ignore them. Thank you. Uh, this was a great, great presentation. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, one question I have is, uh, from the performance perspective, if I take all my business logic, put it into a store procedure, okay, on a Redshift database or wherever that is, right? Yep. How does that impact what uh, the recommendations you have provided? That's the first question. I have second question. Okay. Um, I'm not an expert on database stuff. Uh, there's a lot of people that know that stuff in such depth that, uh, that they'd be able to it. I mean, if you're not running, honestly, you shouldn't be running much stuff on the Airflow workers anyways. Again, that's an opinion, opinion not necessarily a fact. So running on a store procedure is probably a good idea anyways. Um, but compute's not free wherever you run it, right? So uh, you know, definitely similar techniques should be able to help regardless of how you're doing it. Okay, great. Thank you. You had a second question? No, I think I'll defer that because you don't know database. <laughs> okay, that's yes. <laughs> Rule number one is always admit you don't know what you don't know. Well, uh, thank you for the um, presentation. So I do have some questions regarding um, the, the DAG generation. So 
instead of changing the DAC generation pattern to uh, to make the you know to, to make the scheduler work more efficiently, why don't we just uh, implement some changes in the uh, airflow um, you know airflow core to to make that um, dynamic uh, DAC generation pattern optimized already? That's an excellent question. I know we have a lot of committers in the room here that I would say we and, and contributors. I think that's. A wonderful idea, and I'm happy to share my thoughts on that with anyone here, because I, I think that's, um, you know, in general, I think the, uh, you know, Airflow's just try to keep out of the way of, of a lot of these things, but I think there's, with enough data like this, we can say, you know what, if we, for example, if we just put a little pause in between some of those schedule loops, there is a, there is a setting for pause on idle for the scheduling loop, but there's no setting for pause on not so idle. Um, and maybe that should be something that should be looked at. We have time for more. Or not. Um, or not. Well, it's getting towards, I mean, it's towards the end of the day and on, on the last day, and that's, that's always a little tough. Uh, if you do think of something else after the fact, please don't hesitate to come up and ask. Um, you know, I, I have done most of this from just playing around with Airflow myself and figuring out what it does and does not do in all these situations. So, uh, and most of the, the I think ideas I get for things that, to try out comes from speaking to Airflow users. So please don't hesitate to come up, say, hey, I have this problem, I couldn't figure it out, or I have the, you know, any suggestions. That helps me as much as it helps you, and I really appreciate that. And if you think of something a few months from now, maybe that's a next year Airflow talk. It might be, exactly. Yeah, and, and, and And I'm, I also do hover around the Airflow Slack, uh, especially in the Airflow-AWS channel, so uh, don't feel, uh, don't be uh, afraid to, to tag me on there and ask a question right there. Cool. Well, thank you again. Let's give John another round of applause. Thank you all very much.